So, let's talk about some dangers of poor theology. Um, the first is that it distracts. Um, for instance, in 1 Timothy 4, 7, it says this. 1 Timothy 4, 7, if I can find it. First Timothy 4, 7, and it says this. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. So the first thing we see about poor theology is that it distracts. Like, for instance, um, on, my sh on, my, on my thing here, I have a really tiny lettering. Um, just a nonsensical sentence, or a couple sentences. It, do it, it makes no sense. It's just random things thrown together. And um, how many of you guys noticed that? One, two, three. That's what poor theology... I was theolo trying to read that in, but I can't read that part. Yeah. That's what poor theology does. It distracts us. It's a minor thing that, that, that for some reason we allow ourselves to get, ourself, and to get our eyes off the big deal. What, as Christians, what's the big deal? Jesus? Yes, which means that we should... Well, oh, yeah, witness. yes, the, yes, yes. The, the good news of Jesus, that, that's, that's the big deal. But what poor theology does is it gets us really, really focused on something that's actually not really even part of our main focus. You know what I mean? It distracts. <coughs> so the second thing that it does is also found in 1 Timothy 4.16. Um, and that's it, it causes us to, to live <coughs> lives that aren't very God-pleasing. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. Pers by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So he's saying there, by having good the I'm sorry, the sheets are right here if anybody wants one. Um, by, having, by having good theology, Paul tells Timothy that he will save his hearers and himself. See, it causes, um, it causes uh, uh, moral living, or poor theology causes immoral living, I should say. Um, where should Christians stand on environmental issues? Who, ha who did anybody take this question? No. Can you go back? Tom? Yes, absolutely. Sorry. Boop. I. Took you took that one. Uh, did you find any uh, research on that that is, um, let's just say, helpful to this discussion? No, I didn't want to add my opinion. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, well, you can still share your opinion then. No, um, we should take care of it, not be tree huggers, but not destroy it, you know? Okay. We should recycle, um, not kill, um, extinct animals and stuff like that, you know? Well, if they're extinct, I don't think we can kill them, but I know what you're saying, I know what you're saying. <laughs> don't, don't push an animal to extinction, what yeah. you're saying, gotcha. Um, so you didn't really have any time to look at the Bible? No, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, did anybody else take this one? No. Okay. Well, then we'll just go ahead and press on to the uh, to the things here. First off, the earth is God's, not man's. I think that's kind of an important issue because sometimes, even as Christians, we kind of live like it's our planet. We can do whatever the heck we want with it. You know what I mean? And so, some uh, Genesis one one. Let's start there. And if it's not in Genesis one one, it's not worth knowing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, that's a Inside joke. <laughs> In hindsight, now realizing that I am recording, probably not the best thing uh, to say, but whatever. <laughs> uh, Genesis one one says, "In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth," and it goes on with the with the with the details there. But you know, this is something that God made, which obviously leads to the question of why did He make it, which is then answered in other parts of Scripture. God made everything to bring glory to Himself. So, um, Psalm twenty four one. Where are you, Psalms? Ah, hiding behind robbers. 24.1 The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. So the first point here is that the, the earth is God's and not man's. Um, the second is that God cares for his creation. Um, Numbers thirty-five, thirty-three says 
says this. Um, you shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, and no atonement can be made for the land. Sorry. <laughs> and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. Did everybody get that? <laughs> Basically, nobody can make make atonement for for blood that's been shed except for the person who did the shedding of the blood. I know it's kind of. Basically, okay, I kill Serena. There's blood on there's 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 blood on the land. Okay, the only person who can make atonement for that would be me. See, I mean, I would have to pay for that crime because I'm the one who did it. Mm -hmm. That make sense? Okay. All right. Um. <clears throat> um. And uh, we'll, we'll look at this in other parts about God caring for the creation. Um, but for now, just kind of roll with me on this. Um, third, we were, we were entrusted with it. Genesis 1.28. Once again, just like money. The money that you have is not your own. God entrusts you with your money. The life you have, everything you have, it's a stewardship thing. You are entrusted before God. The planet is the exact same way. God entrusted it to us. Now, a lot of times we get a little bit confused on, on, on you know, why we do certain things. Um, Genesis 128 says, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then 2.15, I think I went too far, yes. The Lord God took the man and put man in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. He put it and put them there for a reason. Okay, to work it and to keep it. Okay, so, um, the but also, so, so we've looked at this. The earth is God's, that God cares for it, that he entrusted us to care for it as well. But then we go to this. The care of the earth is not task number one. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, which I'm not going to read, but it basically says this. All authority has been given to me, so therefore you all go and make disciples of all of all of all the nations. I'm I'm obviously skipping you know a lot a lot of content there, but you can read Matthew 28 for yourself. Um, moral of the story being the task that he gave us when he left was not make sure that the earth is in perfect condition when I come back. Okay. The main point. Uh, this isn't done yet. You're just gonna have to take another picture. Um, the main point w was that was that people are saved. So is it important that we take care of the planet? Yes. Everything says yes, but not task number one. Um, there definitely is is no basis for going to the extreme of you know, well, for lack of a better word, the hippie. You know that that extremist thing. You know, there's no real ground for that. Um, the Earth is not eternal. Revelations 21, uh, one among many other places that that mentions this, um, the idea that the that the Earth is even passing away as we're living here before God even you know burns it with fire. Revelations 21, uh, 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. See, God's going to bring a new new earth that's going to be per, uh, perfected as this one was before the fall. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? So ultimately we need to keep that in sight, that no matter how good of, uh, we take care of the planet, it will be destroyed in the end. So there, there there's a balance there. Um, so this leads leaves us with two warnings. Don't be fatalistic. Well, the earth is going to be destroyed anyways, so I don't have to do anything to, to care for it. Fatalism. Or extremism. Well, God entrusted us with it, so I have to be weird about it. You see what I mean? Like, the, there are extremes that you don't even have to be worried about. Mm -hmm. Task number one is to witness to people. That That's go and go into the, into the nations and tell people about Jesus Christ. Task number one. However, it is a good thing that we are told to do, but, you know, we're not going to lose our salvation because we littered. Okay, let's just put that on record. So everybody kind of understand this in context, okay? We should take care of the planet, but we shouldn't get weird about it, okay? <laughs> well, I run into a lot of people that go to extremes on this one. Either they do nothing for the planet, or they do way too much for the planet. It's like, okay, well, that's good and all, but when's the last time you went to church? Oh, I don't go to church. There's a bunch of, hi bunch of hypocrites. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I, I guess I understand that. Um... So then the second question. I didn't really want to spend too much time. Oh, I'm sorry. That was your. That was when you should take the picture. Um, I didn't want to spend too much time on this one because you know nobody took that. So I don't want to. I'd rather ha enjoy the discussion. Um, how should Christians treat animals? Did anybody take this one? 
Okay, which ones did you guys take? Let's start with that. We probably all took the same one. Probably. <laughs> What'd you guys take? I took this one, but then I didn't do anything with it. Oh, okay. Okay, well that makes me feel better. Somebody else was okay. What'd you take? The this the drinking and this. Okay. Uh, you? Uh, Christian and wealth. Do it. The wealth. Oh, the wealth. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, you already told me. I did wealth also. Oh, okay. And what'd you do? Oh, yeah, you did the drinking. The that the, the one that Diana did. What'd you do? Uh, it's okay if you didn't have time to get to it. God. You forgot? Yeah. Oh, okay. No, that, that's fine. That's fine. Don't 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 beat yourself up. So I'll try not to, to take too long in this one either so we can get to the discussion part. So um, in hindsight, maybe I should have assigned a certain one a certain questions to each person. <laughs> maybe I should have done that. Next time. We live and we learn. <laughs> so okay, how should how should Christians treat animals? And let me back up here. Did you know that I have twenty eight chickens? Twenty eight. Did you know that each one of my chickens has a different personality? Did you know that every dog I've ever had has had a different personality? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. People who condone animals being equal with people always hype on the point that animals do have personalities. Mm -hmm. Which I'm not arguing that animals do have personalities. <coughs> so now let's look forward into what the Bible says. First off, animals are not like people. Let's just say they're not equal. Besides the, the the obvious reasoning that we have on this one, you can own a dog, right? And people don't think it's wrong, right? right. But you can't own a person, right? Mm -hmm. Having your dog sleep outside is normal and natural. Having someone who's a living child. with you live outside or a child, okay, well, there would be a, a good example of abuse, right? Yeah. Okay, Genesis. But, but this goes besides just obvious reasoning. But Genesis 126 says this. Um, and then God said, let us make man in our image. Okay, every creature had the breath of life, but only man was made in God's image. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a difference there. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, um, and, the, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Basically, have man as the apex, the apex predator. He's going to be, I'm going to charge him with it. Okay, so the, there's the first sign that God has set us apart from all other created and created things. Um, 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Who did was God talking to? Yeah. Who did he give the command to? Yeah. Did he ever give it to anybody else? No. Does it specifically say that he went to man and told him? Yeah. Second thing we can see here is that God wasn't worried about the animals eating the wrong fruit. Why? Because they couldn't make moral decisions. See what I mean? God wasn't concerned about the animals sinning. Okay. So, then that takes us to Exodus 21, 12-14. So, before the fall, all the animals were living in peace with each one, one another, right? Uh you know, I was I'm kind of confused about that because God made some animals who are clearly carnivorous, and I can't really imagine being on a different diet, like for instance a lion. But then He uses the imagery of lions and lambs in the new right. new earth. Yeah. So I'm a little bit confused on that. And also, man wasn't even allowed to eat meat until after Noah. Mm -hmm. So what happened? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question that I have wondered. And I do not know. I think it's one of those things we'll never know. We'll never. We, <laughs> there's. I'm curious, not that I care. There, there's th that, no, but seriously, I do care because it irritates me when I can't <laughs> figure out an answer. It's like, ah, oh, no. Me, that's not <laughs> I just wonder. <laughs> Exodus uh, 21, um, 12 to, to 14. Whoever strikes a man so that he, sh he dies shall be put to death. Okay, review. If you kill somebody, you're you're guilty of murder and you have to be killed. Okay? But if he did not lie and wait for him, but God let him fall into into his hand, basically an accidental death, then I will appoint for you a place to which he may flee, which is later called a, a city of refuge. Um, but if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. Then we go down to... Let's see that. Yeah, I did that. Uh, 33 through 34, and it says, When a man opens a pit, or when a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restoration. He shall give money to its owner, and the dead beast shall be his. 
he's not killed. Yeah. The animal life wasn't as valued as the human's life, was it? Let's keep reading. Uh, Matthew... And, and there's different things like that, too. For instance, if there's an animal that is known to be aggressive and they didn't do something about it, there's a different punishment than an animal who was not aggressive that just... You know, yeah, I, I was reading about that, so. too, about the... Uh, the gores. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's important to notice that the animals and the people are treated differently. If you want to know more about this, as Chuck was saying, read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Yeah. It's, it's in there. Um, it was in Exodus. Um, Matthew twenty two thirty seven um, to forty, and he said uh, to him, "You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind." Okay, review. Love what? Um, okay, this is the great, great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, review. What's the first? Love God. What's the second? Love your neighbor. Okay, all right. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Um, the context here is making it absolutely clear. He's not saying your neighbor creature. He's saying your neighbor person. Okay, <laughs> I can't really get into it right now, but if you look at the Greek, it's just obvious, and so I'm not even going to waste my time with this. Um, but there are other ways he could have said this if he was trying to say every living thing, which he's not. So, um, okay. So we see that it's not like people and God never told us to love animals, did he? He told us to love people and to love him, okay? Um, however, this does not mean that we should treat animals inhumanely, okay? So once again, people go to the extremes on this one too. Um, I don't like animals, so I'm just not even going to, you know, I'm just going to go to the other extreme and, and be abusive towards animals. Well, that's a little bit creepy and sociopathic, but whatever. Uh, Exodus um, 23.4 says this. Um, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, whose, do whose ox or donkey? Your neighbor's donkey. No, your enemies. Oh, yeah, yeah. Didn't say your neighbor, it said your enemy. Um, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him, even if you hate the person. See? Um, so let's – we'll keep on this. Hold on. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest that your – what do you think he's about to say? That your blank and your blank may have rest. What do you think he's going to say? Nope. Nope. What? Ox and something. Ox and donkey. So your ox and donkey may have rest. Okay. And the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. I, in fact, I think he didn't even mention so that you may be refreshed. Let me double check this. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may have rest, the son of your servant woman and the alien. Yeah, he never even mentioned so that you can have rest. No. Pretty, pretty important little details for us to miss, right? Because I didn't see this before. I thought it said so that you may have rest. It doesn't say that. The focus is on the other person. Okay. So if God cares enough for the animal to have rest on the seventh day, don't you think that he cares a little more for the people? You know what I mean? Um, but anyways, that's just a little side note that I threw in there. Uh, my point being here that, that we aren't supposed to treat animals inhumanely. Proverbs 12.10 says this, Whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his beast. But the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Whoever is righteous, okay, uh, has regard for the life of his beast. Mm -hmm. The righteous person cares for his animal. Right. See? See what it said there? Yeah. But the wicked person, even his, even the good thing that the wicked person does is cruel. See, the, the contrast here is the righteous person even care, cares for the lowest of his household, his animal. But the wicked, the good things that he does are still terrible. See what he's saying there? So, um, so we shouldn't be treat animals inhumanely, but also we see that the animals cannot be saved. Throwing out the dozens and dozens and dozens of passages that talk about people being saved, I chose to just look at this one. Matthew, um, whoops, Matthew one twenty one says this. She. Oop. She will bear a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins, not animals from the sins. Okay. 
Um, I'm not going to go into it any further, but animals are never entered into the, in the equation anywhere it talks about salvation. Only people are ever referenced. So, um, obviously, there are so many different references. I was like, why even write it down? You would, I would have to read you the whole New Testament, and it's just not even worth your time. Um, they will be on the new earth, but not necessarily the same pets that you have on this earth. It never says that your pets will be resur in the resurrection. It never says that. It says that there will be animals in the new earth. Okay? Like a Do what? <laughs> um, but anyways, Isaiah uh, 11... 11 uh, 6 through 9 The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion will, will and the I'm sorry and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them the cow and the bear shall graze, the young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Well, at least when all of those are going to be there. Uh, <laughs> uh, 65.17 <laughs> For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Did you hear what he said there? The former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Hmm. Let me just kind of clarify this, okay? So it doesn't say anything about our pets mm -hmm. being in heaven or whatever, okay? But regardless, we need to remember who God is. It's not as it's, it's him, right? Yeah. So we need to be okay with the things that, that he says, you know what I mean? And also we need to keep in mind this passage, that the former things won't even be remembered. So it, it won't be important to you then. I know right now it might seem like a really big deal, but we need to remember um, that God does as he wants. Um, but we also see that God cares for animals. Um, in fact, this is a major point of contrast um, for some passages in the Bible. Psalm 147, especially this Luke passage we're going to look at. Um, nine? Yeah. He gives the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. And there were other ones like this where it basically says that, that God is the one who is providing for animals. Okay. Uh, and then in Luke 12, 6, a lot of these I just cut short so that it wouldn't be 20 billion different passages. Um, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten by God, uh, before God. And another passage says that you know God cares when even a sparrow uh, falls. So um, obviously, uh, God does care for the animals. So animals are not family. That's the first thing that we see here. People are family. I know that in, in an age where a lot of people hurt a lot of people's feelings, it's very common to find your hope and your faith in animals. Um, this is very unbiblical, though. The Bible always mentions about forgiving those who have wronged you, praying for those who persecute you. Um, it, it, it never says substitute them with animals. It never says that kind of stuff. Um, it never says, it tells us to love animals. It always says to love people. It, the focus is always on people. Um, and I think uh, one reason for that is because when you start loving animals, you get, what did I say at the very beginning? You get sidetracked. You start paying attention to things that are actually just time wasters. You start spending all your money on your animals. You start spending all your time on your animals. Eventually, you have no ministry because all your time is animals. All you care about is animals. The Bible says whatever your whatever basically whatever you're you're most in love with will be wherever your heart is. I don't really want to get into that verse right now. We'll leave it for some other time. But basically, you know, you will always. Anyways, moving on. Um, um, also, they shouldn't be treated equally with people. Okay, saving saving endangered animals, good. Okay, awesome, cool. Putting animals above people, not awesome. Okay, and I know some people, oh, well, this dog was abused, that person deserves to die. It's like, whoa, <laughs> dial it back about 30 notches. No, they shouldn't have, have treated their, their animal wrong, obviously, as we've looked at here, duh. But that doesn't mean we should go to the other other extreme and, you know, calm down here with that. Uh, not even the not even the the mosaic law commanded people to be killed for that one. You know, <laughs> dial it back. Um, so animals are not family; they're not treated equally with people, and are not your purpose in life. 
Sometimes we get the idea with animals that they are our purpose. Who knows why I'm raising chickens? Anybody? To help people. To help people. I'm raising them so that people can have cheap eggs. Mm -hmm. What do you go to when you see when you go to the store? There's like over three dollars for a dozen eggs. That's insane. Yeah. It's wrong, but it doesn't cost that much for them to produce the eggs. I know. And they're mass producing them. I have a small farm. They're mass producing these suckers. No way do they need to make that much in, in money for it. It's just, no. This is not a thing. But they're charging that much because, you know, that's what businesses do. It's it's their job to be a business, not to be a person. Um, but it's my job, you see what I mean, to, to try and help people, and so I'm raising chickens. See what I mean? Do you understand the difference there? Because the, the, some people raise – we were talking about this the other day. People who raise animals just to have a petting zoo, I mean – I get that you care for animals, but that doesn't mean that every animal is under your care. No. It, it, there's a difference here, and it, and it, 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 what it'll do is it'll make you spiritually immature. Eventually, spiritually immature. Eventually, you don't have to like them. For instance, you know, my dad does not like pets. He, he doesn't. He doesn't really like animals. I mean, I'm sure he's he likes some animals, but he's not real crazy about the whole pet thing. Um, but however, you shouldn't love animals. You don't have to like them. I mean, wait, did I say that right? Yes, you don't have to like them, but you shouldn't love them. I would even go to the go go to the go to the ex extreme of saying that it's dangerous to love animals. Liking them is one thing. You don't have to, but you know that's one thing that we are should probably do and treat them humanely and these kinds of things. But you don't have to love them. Okay? You guys are all got real quiet and just staring, so I don't want to mutiny here. Nobody's gonna stone me, right? Okay, all right. I don't want animal anyway, so. Um, okay, so that's the end of that topic. Any questions on this one? Uh, I'm sorry. Were there any questions on the first topic? I'm sorry. No. Okay. Any questions on this topic? No? Okay, I don't want to be going too too fast here. I'm just trying to get to the places that you guys actually looked up. So, okay. All right. So, can Christians be wealthy? Who had this one? You and, and you? Okay, let's start with Nicole. I didn't really get a chance to do the research on it. Okay. As far as opinions go. Okay. I think it's okay for Christians to be wealthy as long as it doesn't go to the extreme of being greedy. Okay. Okay. All right. Serena? <laughs> I'll try not to be lengthy. I'll try and, like, keep <laughs> let me Let me stop you right there. Um, how many pages do you have, Serena? Uh, no, I don't have pages. Okay, all right. How many verses do you have, Serena? A few. Let me get something to eat. You go ahead. Oh, whatever. <laughs> oh. Seriously? Yeah, go ahead. It's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, hold on. This one. This one. Okay, so the verse that I'm going to use, which is a very well-known word verse, and I'm sure is one of those that's misused and whatnot, but... They do that? Sometimes. Yeah. Say it ain't so. I never heard of that. <laughs> okay, so it's in Mark 10, and it's verse start, starting in verse 23. And Jesus looking around to his disciples... Or, and Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard will it be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? The, the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So, like, at first you think that's impossible. Like, a camel cannot go through the eye of a needle. So it's impossible for a wealthy man to go into heaven, right? But then as you go down, Jesus says, with people, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. If God wants to make a camel go through the eye of the needle, he can do that. So essentially it's saying that's not impossible for a wealthy man to go to get into heaven. Um, but, um, and then as you go down further, um, <coughs> it says that... Um, Ever, anyone can be saved. It's God's desire for everyone to be saved. So, who can be saved? Anyone can be saved, whether they're wealthy or not. Anyone can can be saved. So, um, 
I think, um, and, and okay. in this same book, in, in Mark 10, it talks about the, the, the man who is telling Jesus, I've obeyed all of your laws since I was born, and I've done this and I've done that. And Jesus said, you need to give up all of your possessions and follow me. He had an abundance of wealth, and Jesus told him to give it up. Why did Jesus told, tell him to give up his wealth? Because this man was submitted to God in every other area of his life but his wealth. So Jesus had him give it away. I think that, yes, a Christian can be wealthy, but they need to be have their wealth and everything in submission to God, just like every aspect of our life should be in submission to God. So should our wealth and everything that we possess. Hmm. That wasn't too lengthy. Okay. You made me think. Well, I got two. I got two wings here, buddy. Like what? The, <laughs> <laughs> that I, was one wing stuff. I didn't want to be like talking forever. <laughs> Can you keep up your Bible app and yeah. turn these passages for me? Yeah. I have wing hand. It's it's a it's a yeah, dangerous yeah. condition. I have wingers. <laughs> Wealth is not necessarily a sign of God's blessing. I want to start that out here. Go ahead and turn to Proverbs 22 too. Um, sometimes it's gotten the idea has gotten going that um, wealth is because God has blessed you. A part of this came from passages like I think it's I think Jeremiah 29:11 in one translation says something like this: "I will prosper you" or something like that. The word there, prosper, is not talking about money. Okay, uh, get that a little bit clearer. If you look in other translations, they translate it differently. Um, so, you know, there's that. But then also there's other passages where it kind of gets the same idea going on, too, that, you know, somehow where people have, excuse me, taken it out, out of context and basically said, you know, hey, I, 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 I just have to pretty much name it and claim it because I'm one of God's righteous. And we've already talked about the naming and claiming doctrine, how, how wrong it is and whatnot. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. But instead, I want to go to Proverbs 22, too. Okay. Which says... The rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. Mm. God has made the rich man and the poor man. He made them both. I think that's kind of important in any discussion that we're talking about here. Um, second, uh, Christians must use what they have wisely. Uh, Proverbs 6, 10 through 11 says... She'll look there in a minute. Um, Wait, what, is the thing? what is it? Proverbs 6, 10 through 11. Okay. Let me finish up this ring and I'll help you. It was really good. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put down the wing down. No, it's not. No. no. <laughs> okay, you want me to go ahead and read? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond, and your need like an armed man. Basically, by not working hard you will cause disaster to come on you. Basically, what he's saying is this. If you want to be wealthy, work. A little slumber, a little folding of the hands, oh, I'll do it later. If you do it later, it won't get done. Do it now. Um, creation is much as what they have wisely. All throughout the Bible, there's this idea of urgency. Before the bridegroom comes, you know, always being ready, always staying on your alert. This idea of, of you know, this is what you have. You can choose what to do with it. You know, there's the parable of, of, the, of the different people given the different amounts of money. And they had to do differently according to what they could do with it. And, and I could show you many, many examples of what the Bible talks about, about being, a, being wise, being a shrewd manager, that kind of stuff. So turn to James 5, 1 through 6. And this is a passage that a lot of people who, who claim that Christians can't be wealthy use in support of this view. But after Serena um, reads it, I'll kind of show you what, she, what he's actually talking about in James. Okay. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your fl flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, and which has been withheld by you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of, of Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. 
You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. What is happening here is there's these wealthy landlords who are withholding pay that was earned. Which, if you've ever read the, the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, big no-no. Big no-no. I'll let you, I'll leave the surprise up to you. Uh, read it through, I highly encourage you, but you'll see in there. Big no-no. Um, and then they were also, uh, let me say, enamored with the pleasures of this life. You read through James 5, 1 through 6 yourself. You'll see it in there. And it wasn't, so the, the issue was not that they had money, it was their use of their money. It was their moral living. And the money wasn't necessarily evil. Okay? Um, and <clears throat> another reason why a lot of times people look to money to be evil is because they translate um, they, they translate that passage that Paul says, the love of money um, is a root. Is, yeah, it, no, yeah, the root. That's, yeah, that's what I meant to say. Is the root of all evil. In fact, how many times have you heard this? Money is the root of all evil. That's not what the passage says at all. Um, okay. That takes us to Christians must must not show contempt for others. Um, if you could turn to First uh, Timothy six seventeen. This was the other um, passage that I had. First Timothy. Yeah. Did you find it? Instruct those who are rich in this present world not Okay. I'll stop right there. What did you just say? Instruct, instruct those who are what? Rich. He just admitted that there are rich people in the, in the church, right? Uh -huh. And he didn't say anything bad about it, right? Right. Now progress to what he tells them to do for these rich people. Go ahead. Okay. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Man, that is a good passage. Read it again. And I, really, guys, listen to what he's saying here. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasures, the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Now. Yeah. I highly encourage you guys to write that one down and read, read through that a couple of times throughout this week. And that's just a good one. 1 John 3.17 says this, But if anyone has the world's goods, excuse me, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Basically, he's saying if you have the ability to help someone and you don't help that person, how can you say that God's love is with you? How can you say you, that you love people if you have the ability to help and you're not? Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Now, let me just throw up this clause here. He's not saying throw money at homeless people. Okay. Yeah. Because sometimes people are – please hear what I'm saying. Sometimes homeless people are homeless for a reason. Because they have addictions, because they have this or that or the other thing, okay? Not saying don't show compassion. Well, see, they, most of them, they choose to live that way. A lot of them do, especially around here. In fact, some around here will actually choose it above an actual living situation. But that's not really my point. My point is this. Money is not necessarily the way to help them. Yeah. Okay? There's no easier, easier way to say that. Um, sometimes they need food. Sometimes they need clothes. But out of all the things that Jesus praised his servants for giving to people, when you went and visited people in jail, you visited me. When you let people live with you, you or, or come and stay with you when they didn't have a place to stay, you let them. You did it to me. When you fed the hungry, when you when you gave water to the thirsty, he never once says when you gave money to those without money. Mm -hmm. He never once says that. We were never called to throw money at homeless people. 
okay? And if your brother is in need, you provide the need is what it says. It does not say throw money at them. Why I'm pounding this into the ground? Because you do more harm than good by giving out handouts. Okay, I was actually having a conversation with Joe about this uh, a couple weeks ago. Sometimes when you give people money, it just backfires in your face. Well, I'll give you an example. Somebody comes to the church, and they're in need of money. Or they're in need. And so they ask you for money. You give it to them. Then they can't pay you back. They feel really stupid, and they don't come back. Right. You just lost somebody from the congregation, from a potential new Christian, because of an issue of money. And usually it's something like, what, 10 bucks? Yeah. Oh, I'll just forget about it, but they feel ashamed, so they don't even come back. See what I mean? Because you threw money at them. Mm -hmm. Throwing money doesn't solve the problem. All it does is give you a temporary feeling of being a good person. And then eventually you get mad at somebody and you lose that feeling. See what I mean? It's just, it don't... Okay. Um, okay, so the idea here is not showing contempt for others. The, the, all this is showing not on the thing, the money, but on the heart of the person with the thing. Okay. Um, notice that he says, woe to you rich people. He didn't say, woe to you, woe to you money. Yeah. yeah. It was the people. Okay. So, um, Proverbs 11.1, um, I'll look at that one, but if you can look at Mark 10. By the way, I completely blame all of this on Ben, who chose to bring the wings. It's your fault. I'm not. I'm not taking any ownership for this. Um, Eleven one. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. <sighs> Money can be dangerous. Mark ten twenty one through twenty three. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, "One thing you lack: go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me." Judging by the way that Luke addresses Theophilus, at the beginning of Luke and Acts, he says, O Theophilus. Okay? Judging by the way in the Greek structure, how he's addressing Theophilus, it seems as though Theophilus was a man of wealth. If you read through Luke and Acts, pay attention to what happens to wealth in the book. He's always talking about, in Acts, for instance, it picks up and says, all the Christians were giving up all their money. It goes through all these different things of wealthy people just not caring about the money anymore. Luke was writing to a wealthy person. Don't you think that that was kind of an important detail to include? Because the, the emphasis was on the spread of the gospel, not on the wealth. And it'll read through Acts. Is the, it, where, where is the emphasis on, 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 on as you read? See, I mean, it's talking about the gospel spreading. Uh, the Holy Spirit is moving on all these different people. Even the, even the Romans and Greeks are getting the Holy Spirit. It's like, what? But then, it just throws in these little stories about, oh, and this person had money and they give it away. And then it shows around, I forget what chapter, but with Peter, uh, Anna, Anna, Ananias and Sapphira with the issue of money. When they sold their land and lied about it. And what, why did he include that? And what happens to them when they lie about the money? Peter says, you had the money in the first place. You didn't have to give it up. Yeah. But then when you did this, you you purposed in your heart and you lied against the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so they both end up dying. Long story short. You can read it through Acts and yourself. But why did Luke throw that little story in there? Don't you think there were lots of different things happening in the early church? Why did he throw that story in? Because wealth is a big factor for Luke because he's writing a very wealthy person, Theophilus. So anyways, uh, which takes us to Luke 16.13. Hey, Serena, go ahead and go to 1 Timothy 6, 9-11. Um, Luke 16.13, which says, which says this. Um, <clears throat> no servant can serve two masters, for, he will, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Okay, And this is actually applicational to many different things. You cannot serve your iPhone and God. So, I mean, you cannot serve whatever it is that your heart is so set on. Okay. In this audience, it would have very specifically been money because of you know, I, this discussion for another day. But that was the biggest thing at that time, which it still is today. But you get what I'm saying. Go ahead with first temple. There was neither one. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 
But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and just and gentleness. Now he's talking about fleeing from the love of money and the effects of the love of money. Flee those things. He doesn't say flee money. Right. Okay. But there's a few words I really want to pay attention to here. The love of money. Not the money itself, but the love of money. And then also another word, very important word, is a root of all kinds of evil. And then pick up after that, there's there's one more word that, that is kind of important. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for And it. some by longing for it. Not everyone who longs for it. Right. See what he said there? So he's giving an example of something that occasionally happens. See what I mean? So, I think that's kind of important to know. Um, however, when we allow anything to have control over our lives, it uh, is very binding for us. Those that are under a greater oblig I'm sorry, those that have are under a greater obligation for the than those who do not have. Uh, Matthew 25. Let's say, for instance, you are dirt poor. You have no money. You have no job. You barely have enough food to make it for today. Are you going to be expected to do as much as the person who lives in a seven uh, not seven sorry seven bedroom mansion no see what I mean for those who are given much much is expected of them and that's what this path passage in Matthew 25 says um, which I don't have um, enough time to really get into the depths of this passage but I'll just give it a real brief reading um, and you'll kind of see the flow of it and verses 28 through 29 it says um, mm -hmm. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. The person with the one talent didn't use it wisely, so he said, okay, give it. Take that from him and give it to the person who already had ten. Uh, instead of the other person who only had a few extra, I think it was like three or five or something like that. For to everyone who has uh, will, will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then down in verse 37 through 40. It says, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did, uh, did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Um, I also want to point out something else in the story that we already looked at. That story that Serena brought up, where the where the person was, where the rich person was told to sell everything that he had. Does it say and give the money to the poor? Yes. Hmm. That's something that that that, that would be a good thing to look at over the week. Um, because remember, I said uh, God didn't tell us to throw money at people. Right. So that would be a good passage for one of you guys to look into. If you're curious. If not, then it's not. Let's say some people might need it. Let's say somebody needs like to pay off their house or whatever. Like I mean, like back then, you know, some people they were poor and I mean, just a shed for them, it's a house. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Um. I mean, some some people they have right mind. They they want to mean well and do stuff. Yeah. They just don't have it. Um, they didn't really have. Well, I see what you're saying. Just a side note, they didn't really have mortgages on stuff like that to like pay off houses and stuff like that. But it, that was a good point though. Just a pointless. In fact, I don't even know why I mentioned that little historical tidbit. Um, but yeah, that's, that's actually a good point. And the um, Bible does say to take care of widows and orphans, which yeah. more than yeah. likely are poor and yeah. are in, could use yeah. help of money. Mm -hmm. So once again, and that is something that's worth looking into. I'm telling this to you guys because I'm probably not going to look at it. Too. No, probably not going to look at it. But if you guys are interested, hey, you know, hey. What you do is you ask somebody who you know doesn't have a commentary. You know, like, hey, Zach, look that up. And then they're like, uh, uh. <laughs> and then they go to Wikipedia. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. No, that's what you do in high school. I mean, in college. <laughs> but, Professor, I worked really hard on this paper. <laughs> Although now they tell you, do not use Wikipedia right. to look up your information in your Well, life. I'm sorry, but what moron got that idea? in his head. I'm paying for a degree, a college degree, in which people are going to, you know, depend on me to know something, and I'm going to Wikipedia, an open source, which literally anybody can put anything on, and I'm going to use that? 
Okay. Like, how lazy can you get? Why even go to college if you stoop to that level? Why? Yeah. Why? What was that, Gracie? What was that? Sometimes you just have to write a paper really fast. Guilty. Table of one. Guilty. <laughs> can Christians drink, smoke, do drugs, whatever, etc. Fill in the blank. Um, especially uh, marijuana a few years ago was really a big deal. Remember? With the whole legalization in Colorado or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people really got... You know, uh, whatever you want to say about this one. Uh, who did this one? You and you. Okay, let's have Diana go first. Because uh -uh. <laughs> you're the quieter one. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't want him to say something and you and you to say this. Yeah, what he said. Yeah, he said it all. <laughs> so I okay. can do that. <laughs> I kind of separated the wine with the smoking and the drugs. The the what? Wine. The wine oh, okay. The oh, okay. The smoking and the drugs. Because on a, on a drinking, that's a, I mean, I, I look up, and I mean, Jesus used wine for like communion. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was used to, to represent the body, I mean, the blood, the, it was, you know, a, a yeah. remembrance. And also, uh, and the Bible also says that no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake to your stomach. And you and uh, your frequent oil mint or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. So, a lot. I mean, uh, a lot of people they use that like for like. Well, the Bible says you can drink wine, but they don't actually don't don't read the whole verse. Why? You, you, I mean, you drink it. So. And, and also uh, about drinking the wine, it says, uh, don't don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revealers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So, like I said, you know, a lot of people, they use it for their own purpose. Oh. And they... Anyway. Well, that was good. Mm -hmm. that, that was very good. <laughs> also, on the smoking and the drugs... Um, on 1 Corinthians 6 12 says all things are harmful are lawful for me but not all things are helpful all things are lawful for me but I will not be enslaved by anything um, and uh, and also Psalm 119 37 turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways uh, and um, another verse in Corinthians says so whether you eat or drink or whether whatever you do, do all things to glorify God. So no matter what you do, if if you use drugs or if you drink or if you smoke, if it doesn't glorify it and it's all attention on you, and then mm, who are you serving? Can I tell a funny story? No. You just said that, and Diana, th this this I've been I've been laughing so hard. Okay. <laughs> somebody said it was when when pot was being uh, legalized in Colorado. Oh yeah. And somebody said to me, they said. <sighs> But God made the marijuana. Surely he wanted us to smoke it. <laughs> and this is what I said. Didn't he make the tree of good and evil too? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, go ahead with what you're saying. Uh, there's I'm sorry. only one verse that I really liked it. And says, Be sober-minded, be watchful your adversaries. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, mm. seeking someone to devour. So, I mean, if your mind is not in the right place, and if you can't think straight... You're going to mm. do wrong things. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. Very good, Diana. Very good. Was that all you were going to say? That's all. Very good. Okay. <laughs> Check. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> I expect this from Ben. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Um, ben. I, I have scriptures here, first of all, regarding where he tells specific people not to drink. Okay. Well, I didn't um, even know that was in there. Seriously? Yeah. Well, let's look there's, this up. There's, there's several of them. Can we look at some of them? Sure. Uh, Leviticus 10.9. Leviticus 10.9. Would you mind if I read it out loud? Go ahead. Okay. I don't have it written down, so... Drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you. When you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And I believe he was talking to Moses and Aaron there. Yeah. Um, numbers 6, 3. 
Oh, I'll I'll look at these later. Go ahead. Um. Anyway, just there's uh number six three Deuteronomy twenty nine six and a couple in Judges where he tells specific people hmm. don't drink. Um. However, there are some scriptures that are positive to wine. Um. If you want to look up an example. Oh sure. Uh, Ecclesiastes nine seven. And everybody says, Ecclesi, what is? <laughs> I've also got one in Amos. <laughs> what? I can't even, I'm so excited, I can't even find Ecclesiastes. Is it before or after Song of Solomon? Ecclesiastes what? 9-7. Go, I, I, I'm freaking out here. You had something to say about Amos? What? <laughs> Go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Okay. Um... So, so we see that there's certain people that he says don't, and then there's some that he, he, he says, okay, go ahead and do this. But there is a warning to avoid drunkenness. Okay. Um, do you want me to look at it? In Ephesians 5.18. Do you want me to read this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And uh, so so you see these three points here, and you can come to this conclusion. First of all, what she said. Just because I can do it doesn't mean I should do it. You know? Um, some people maybe can handle drinking. Others cannot at all. Um... Another thing is, are you going to do something that's going to cause another Christian to stumble by you doing it? And so that's what I have on drinking. On drugs, you know, marijuana and stuff, it's not specifically mentioned in the Bible. So think about this. First of all, what are the laws of the land? We're, to, we're told to obey the laws of the land. No. Um, so you say, well, what about these places? where that is allowed, Colorado and whatnot. Um, so when it's legal, think about this, what Michael, I believe, was talking about earlier. We're supposed to be good stewards of everything that God gives us. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at people <laughs> who have been on drugs, especially heavy drugs, look how they've aged. Look how, you know, their body is just decaying and, and falling apart. That it's not being a good steward. So that's what I got. Yeah, I want to add something onto that. Um, you know, the thing about potheads is they're always under this illusion. They say, they'll always tell you something like this. Pot is actually good for you. It, it's been scientifically proven that pot is actually good for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it actually gives you clarity of thought. And you're not going it, – it, it wards off cancer. And what was, what's the other one that they have to say? Um, oh, and it doesn't make you lazy. Well, dealing with many potheads myself, let me just kind of clarify a few things. First off, it's not a proven fact that, that, that pot does actually – you know, it, it, it is good for you, okay? It's not a proven fact. It's, it, it's still a matter of debate as to whether uh, marijuana smoke is, is any healthier for your lungs as cigarette smoke. I mean, they're back and forth with this one. I don't even know if they've figured out the answer for it. There is some possibility about the whole cancer cell thing, but um, not really not really enough, to, in my opinion, to warrant smoking it. And in my opinion, I've never, ever, ever met a pothead who was not lazy. Because they have, just a second, they have these, they have these ideas, you know what I mean? They're just like, man, I have all the answers to everything. And like, they sit there, and they're just going on about it. It's like, what are you even talking about? But they think that they have, like, the world's smartest thing to say. And then, once they've been off of it for a few days, they're like, what? You know what I mean? Because it, it's nonsense. You know, they sit around doing nothing all day, and then they, they, they get in this idea of how the world is. And it's like, no, that's not what, no. No, that's not how the world works. Man, we should just tell ISIS, man. That we should just tell them this. And it's like, what are you talking about? Have you lost your mind? But anyways, Serena, go ahead. 
No, just um, as a former pothead, I, I smoked a lot of pot in my life. So, um, I, I was a pothead. I smoked it every day, several, several times a day. Well, you're good on cancer then. Everything, <laughs> and, and yes, everything that anybody says defending pot is only to justify using it because none of it is true. Yes, pot makes you delusional. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> and I'm not even joking. It makes you so delusional. It makes you paranoid. I do not ever uh, suggest anybody driving under the influence of weed. Um, you are completely useless when you are high. Um, and yes, it makes you lazy, unmotivated. There's just, I guess if there were health benefits, that would be the only benefit of it. And you better be dying. Okay. Because unless you're dying and are not going to be useful to society anyways, just don't use it because you will be unuseful to society. That's my, sorry. I hate that. I hate it when people say, it does this for you, it does that for you, you can make rope out of it. I'm like, well, you're not defending to make rope out of it, you're defending it to smoke it, but whatever. And it's natural, and this and that. Okay, well, God made catnip too, but I don't think he wants me to smoke it, you know? It's just anything a pothead says about pot is purely to justify them doing it. It's not because they actually believe that. They just don't want to stop doing it. I have a problem. I don't know if there's anything else to add. Um, Christians must not be ruled by the flesh. Already was discussed. We must not watch out for ourselves, but for God and others. Already mentioned. Um, it's not about, Okay, this is something that, that I do want to mention because there are genuinely people who are struggling with addictions. Okay. I know because I see at least one a week. I, 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 I'm very aware of this. Um, it's not about legalism. There are some people who literally are saved for years and still struggle with the exact same thing over and over and over again. Okay, I'm not trying to bring condemnation here. I'm just trying to bring the idea that we shouldn't justify sin just because we're having a hard time with that sin. There's some people who are under the idea of this. To stop the war on, dr on drugs, all we need to do is legalize the drugs, mm -hmm. and then people will stop doing drugs. Okay. Did they stop drinking? <laughs> it's the dumbest thing, literally. And, and you know the thing is, is they actually believe this nonsense. Well, I heard, I heard a, was it anti-choice, uh, pro-abortionist? I heard an, a pro-abortionist say this one time: If pro-lifers are so concerned about uh, abortions, why don't they just legalize it so that way people stop having stop having so many abortions? What? I, I honestly don't have time to refute such a stupid argument. Maybe some other time. But my point being, we shouldn't legalize something just because we're having a hard time with it. That's my point. Um, some have a harder time than others. Don't beat yourself up, up if you are one of these people. Just keep up the good fight, okay? Um, there, I mean, I have my own personal area of battle that is very difficult to overcome. Chuck has his own area. You know, everybody has their own thing going on that is very difficult. I'm not going to look down on you because you have some other, you know what I mean, addictive behavior or whatever. See what I mean? Um, but with that being said, don't justify it, but don't give up. Okay, there's a middle grain there. Keep, keep fighting it. Okay, but just don't don't justify what you're doing. Um, so, I mean, all, all these things we already talked about. Really, pretty much just read through 1 Corinthians and you'll get your answer on all these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Corinthian church was there. Were, there were two groups really dividing the Corinthian church. There was the one, excuse me. There was the one group who was just really into enjoying the lust of the flesh. It's just all about having fun. It's called hedonists, but I don't know if you guys know that word, so I don't want to use it. Um, and then there's these other groups that the word for it is ascetic. A S C E T I C ascetic. What it means is you separate yourself from everything. I'm. I don't want to defile myself with this. And so Paul's trying to, you know, bring these two people into a healthy understanding of how the church should work and how the Christ what Christ accomplished and whatnot. And so if you read through Corinthians you'll see in Corinthians you'll see a good basis between becoming completely separate from the world where you're like a monk and going to the other extreme of indulging in the world. But anyways. Um, in fact, if you look, I didn't have a single reference from anywhere else in scripture. I just used 1 Corinthians. 
I could have used other places, but I figured, hey, why not? Um, so this is this is in the application and the warning of all these different things. What controls you? Okay, I want you on your sheet. I believe I stuck a place on there. Things that control me slash eat up my money and time. Okay, this is just for you. I want you to be real with yourself right now and, and, and think about this. What is controlling you? Is it animals? Is it wealth? Is it clothes? Is it video games? Is it movies? What is it? What is controlling you? Be honest with yourself. You're the only person who's going to see this. I don't care if you don't write anything down. This is for your benefit. Okay, You are only lying to yourself. Um, what you allow to control you is what you will serve, first off, and what you will spend um, most of your money and time on. People who get who get onto video games and it's like they're it's like they're addicted. <coughs> All they spend their money on is video games. All they spend their time on is video games. People here at like at departments, for instance, who get a paycheck, they actually get a check, mm -hmm. and it's gone within the first couple of days on alcohol. That's a problem. That has nothing to do with whether you can drink. That's about whether you should drink. That that's just not healthy. Their bodies are running ragged, as Chuck already mentioned this. You know That's just not even healthy anymore. They should completely abstain from it just for the sake of getting out of that because it's going to be way too difficult to try to put it in proportions. This is going to be way too difficult. Um, but anyways, um, they are spending their time and their money on this. It's affecting their lives. It's affecting, the, affecting their kids' lives. It's affecting their whole family. That's just alcohol. Now let's think about the other things that we let, let control us. iPhones. I remember when iPhones first came out, how many Christians were completely in love with the iPhone to the point of always being on it for everything. So I mean, iPhones are good. Technology is good. Great. But don't let it control you. Don't let it control you. What, what did D Diana say from 1 Corinthians? All things uh, – you can say, that you can say you know, oh, I, I can do all things. But not all things are, are, are beneficial, and I'm not going to let anything rule over me. Okay, so, um, so bad doctrine leads to foolish living. People who don't have a healthy understanding of money, what do they do with their money? They blow it on whatever they want. They go to Walmart just looking instead of for a specific goal. They waste all their money on, on you know, whatever it is that, that, that they love. Clothes, video games, movies, whatever it is that that person loves. See what I mean? And if, if we're honest with ourselves, we all do this. All of us do this, at least in some part. Okay? We give our time and we give our money to things that are not healthy for us because we enjoy it. And I'm not saying you cannot have any pleasures in the world. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is when the pleasure goes to the extreme of owning you, you have a problem. I'll tell you what I'm doing. I have such a problem with mass buying stuff on like Amazon and stuff. I love buying stuff. It makes me feel really good about myself. I love it. Amazon keeps my credit card information. All I have to do is put a bunch of stuff in a, in a button. Right. Put a bunch of stuff in your cart and buy it. And it's yours. And then you can spend weeks looking at it. For instance, my weakness is books. I could spend all the world's money in books. I love them. However, um, I realize that that is something that has captured my attention. So what have I done? This year, last year I did it too. Um... I don't know if we ever said that we're doing it for the whole year, but I'm trying to go. I'm trying to just go. I'm not, I don't really have a time limit set. I'm just going. Cause I made it through all last year. I'm really super psyched about that, but I'm not ready to stop because I realize how much it still controls me. I'm not buying myself anything. Nothing. Nothing. We're buying food, that stuff, gas for the car, that kind of stuff. But when it comes to pleasures for myself, I'm not buying it. Clothes, I haven't bought. Cl well. Addendum, Grace did buy me two pairs of jeans. That that was a thing. She did, and that was in, for Christmas, right? Yeah. Um, so there is that. But I don't buy myself clothes, and when when I do buy, when I do have to buy clothes, I go to places like thrift stores and stuff because I would rather spend my money on something important. I'm gonna wear my clothes out. I raise chickens. I'm gonna wear my clothes out in a couple of years. Why spend too much money on that? See what I mean? And I know other people, like for instance Ben, you know, where you're working in people's homes where you have to dress a certain way. I'm not, you know, whatever. But I'm more talking about it was controlling me, so I abstain from it. See what I mean? And I will eventually buy myself something in the future. I'm not saying abstain from it for life. 
But instead of spending that money, I'm spending my time in prayer instead. And my attitude has increased a lot for the better. A lot for the better. So, um, anyways, um, and I will say this. 95% of people who are bad with money, specifically, specifically money, tell me this. When I was a kid, blank happened. Have you guys heard this? You guys heard this? Okay, when I was a kid, blank happened. Now that I'm an adult, and then they say, you know, this is why I do it now. I understand this. However, remember what I said. Do not justify foolish behavior based off what someone else did. You know what I'm saying? I know some people who drink because their, their dad beat them when they, were, when they were a kid. You're an adult now. You can't let this thing own you. You can't let it get its – because it won't just stop there. It'll sink its fingers in that area and eventually it'll go to something else. What did I say up here? Where is it? Bad doctrine leads to foolish living. Fact of life. Bad doctrine leads to foolish living. What do all these things have in contact with? Detractors from what's really important in your life. Right? Right? We're all on board with this. You guys aren't hating me yet, right? Okay. I can't depend on this one. He's too quiet. He won't even tell me if he did if I did make him mad a bit. See? Like right now. He's mad at me for mentioning him again on on the recording. But you know, he he won't tell me because Secretly one day, by the way, one day Ben will go crazy and start just start killing people and nobody will know. They'll be like, Who did this? We don't know. <laughs> quiet guy. <laughs> Where did Ben go? Did they kill him too? <laughs> Anyways, two people are never happy in the world. Those who seek their heart's desire and those who get their heart's desire. Those who buy video games. There is always another video game. Mm -hmm. Those who buy clothes. There's always another pair of clothing. Those who... You what's know, another thing? Money. Uh, or music. Those who buy music. There's always another CD that comes out. Go ahead. I, I was really big on music. Um, oh, well... <laughs> perfect <laughs> timing. <laughs> from about the time I was 16... To about the time of, uh, let's see, when did we stop buying stuff because of the, we were paying off the flex? Was it last year? Um, I thought it was 14. Well, we paid it 14. off last year. We paid it off. So sometime 2014. 2014. Oh, when we did that, what's his name? Class. Oh, Deaver, yeah. Yeah, so that was so, September. So for yeah. that many years... I had to have at least one CD a month. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had to. And now I've had, I think, maybe, other than what was given to me, yeah. bought on my own maybe like three. Yeah. So. Yeah. But it was like, must have the next CD. It gets where it... And, and my wish lists are still crammed full of them, but it's just like, later. Even later. though you have it on YouTube for free? Well, I feel like that's cheating. Because the, this is <laughs> well, the, I, I understand. I'm actually going to back and check up on this one. The musician did, did work for work for that, and by not paying for it but still enjoying it, you're reaping something someone else's benefits without actually yeah. giving them the pay that they deserve. Yeah. So it, I buy the right. albums. So, right. I mean, Why I, would I, they I put it on YouTube for? Oh, they don't though. A lot of them. So, sometimes they, sometimes they put occasional they songs on to get you to buy the CD, but usually they won't put all their albums on. Usually it's the fans who do. Usually. Or they'll just put like a single. Or right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which actually drums up sales. Yeah. So, um, but anyways, the pe the two people who are never happy, those who 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 are seeking something and they, and they think that it's actually going to bring them happiness, and the person who gets it. <coughs> Because otherwise they're not happy, and so th what is oftentimes what they do is people are very. If you think about it honestly, people are very delusional. They continue. This didn't work. Let's try it again. I bought all these fill in the blank, and it didn't make me happy. I should do it again because mm -hmm. this time it'll make me happy. And they keep up the same insane behavior. Mm -hmm. Literally, it is insane. And I'm not criticizing you guys. I'm saying I do this too. But it never brings happiness. It's just the same circular pattern repeated over and over again. Like, and there's some things that, you know, you do need. Like, for instance, I needed to get Gracie a KitchenAid mixer. And you have no idea the amazing foods that I'm enjoying now. <laughs> if I had not have gotten her that, I would have been sunk. Okay? I have just gotten her this this attachment for the for it. Okay? She's going to make me 
homemade cheese ravioli. <laughs> Buddy, shut the door. <laughs> Buddy, shut the door. Like this is this is a thing now, okay? I I'll sacrifice for that. <laughs> but anyways. So any questions on any of the things we talked about? comment to say about um, um, about the laws now and laws uh, I mean if, if God wanted us for us like to do something I think he would have put it in the Bible you know what I mean like okay yeah. like what are you talking about specifically same with the drugs same with um, you know smoking mm -hmm. or I mean just about anything that is harmful to the body mm -hmm. I mean if God wanted to put it for a reason he would have put it in the Bible hmm. just because people are legalizing it doesn't mean God approves it mm. well I mean I understand what you're saying but don't forget that God doesn't have everything that we need to know in the Bible he only I think what whatever God whatever God thinks that we should know he already set it in place Right. So just because we desire to know more, uh, that gets us in trouble. That's how. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, what's in the Bible are the things that are is necessary for us to grow and mature as Christians. However, He didn't put everything we need to know ever in the Bible. See what I mean? Only the things that we need to know for spiritual growth. See what I mean? So there's some things that they just aren't in the Bible because it's irrelevant. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like marijuana, it existed before. It's not like this is a new invention. This existed before. It's not in the Bible, though. Well, I think you, you've got... Because I'm, I'm... Not that I'm sure, that, but God knew that there would be such a problem with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he would have said it straight from the beginning, you know. This is causes this. And that's why he... You know, the Bible says, you know, if your body's not sober... Uh, you're gonna start doing stupid things, and of course you're gonna worship somebody else. Right, and there's actually a principle that's in, and I'm gonna kind of use what you just said as a platform here. Um, some things God doesn't say specifically in the Bible, but He says a principle in other parts that kind of gets us there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like you used to, we're talking about the passages about drinking. No, no, you were talking about the passages about drinking, but a lot of those same passages apply to other things like smoking and doing drugs and whatnot. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 it relates. Do you know what I mean? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. So anyways. I think further we have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. To, to lead us in. Yes. Okay, and I will use an example. I'm sorry not to go use, off on another Use one. Tangent. Go ahead. I smoked for many, many, many years. And I quit smoking about a year after we moved here. And um, it was something I fought with because I was always like, you know what, why do I have to quit smoking? Smoking is not going to send me to hell, blah, 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 you know? But God mm -hmm. convicted me and told me, stop smoking. Yes. God told me to stop smoking. Yeah, I understand for Christians. And, and yes. so, like... Let, let me, let me kind of... I think what you just said is very important. And I think that a lot of times we do this. We hear something and we start judge, thinking how we can judge our neighbor. Uh -huh. What did she just say? The Holy Spirit does it, right? Sometimes what do we do, though? The Holy Spirit said she could psychic. No, that's not what I'm getting at. Um, we condemn our brother because we try to fulfill the role of the Holy Spirit. Zach, I don't like the way you're spending your money. You're doing this and it's wrong. You need to stop buying name, name brand clothes. See, I have now taken the place of the Holy Spirit. See what I mean? Let God deal with people's hearts. See, I mean, I'm talking about you guys dealing with your heart. That's why it says on the sheet here, things that control me. It doesn't say things that control your neighbor, your wife, your kid, your et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What controls you? See, I mean, in fact, if those of you who have taken the discipleship class from day one, I say, I, I, it's on it's on the sheet. It says this, learn how the lesson applies to you, not everyone else. Yeah. From day one. Because that's what we do as people. Even as, even as for those of you who have ever taught, you start thinking... You start thinking. <laughs> sorry. You start thinking about everybody you, you're teaching in front of, like, like let's say I was talking about um, greed. Ben. <laughs> ben. Yeah, you, he's a greedy guy. He just looks greedy. He says his hair's red. That's the same color as Satan's tail. <laughs> <laughs> But anyways, a good good discussion though, guys. 
Good discussion. A any I didn't mean to cut it short, though. I just kind of get off on tangents sometimes. Did anybody? Were you done saying what you guys were gonna say, or or? Uh, see, like like Christians, they do get that. I mean, the the Holy Spirit convicts them. Mm -hmm. What's the excuse of the un-Christians, the non-Christian people? I have you know something what I mean? for they that They say, well, too. God created, that means we can use it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, see, that's, we'll, we'll come to this turn here in a second. Um, one thing to realize, though, is that the world is already in rebellion of God. So it doesn't matter if they have the law of God. See, that's why Jeremiah See, says. See, they don't believe in God, but they still. Oh yeah, God created. I mean, we can use. I mean, I mean, they 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 don't want to follow God. Right. But then they do use God. Right. And I think. Well, yeah. I have nothing to say to that. <laughs> but then I, I think that Jeremiah. Justify I honestly right. think so too. Uh, I think what Jeremiah says is is very important. He says that it'll be written on their hearts. See what I mean? It's written on our heart. The law of God, God is written on our hearts. When Paul gave us, you know, do this and don't do this in the New Testament, it's not so much a new legalism thing. Well, I have to do this because Paul said it. I have to do this because Paul said it. He's taught. Well, he often says it, says something like this after he says, gives these commands. This is the. This is. This is. Uh, this uh, shows the love of God or something. I forget how he words it, but basically he says this is because we have love. See what I mean? And read through it yourself. I'm not going to waste time on that. You see what I'm saying? We have it written on our hearts, but for those in the world. They don't. What were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say, before I even got saved, God convicted me of something. At the time, I didn't know. Tell us so we can tell other people. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll, I'll share it. I was going to divorce my husband. I was going to divorce him. I went and got the divorce papers, and I filed for divorce, and I was leaving him. And I was going to move out of... I was going to leave the country, actually. I, I was going to move to Germany with my sister. That's hot. And I was sitting there, and you know what? Just something told me, you cannot leave. You can't go. This is not right. And But everything in my being was telling me, but why not? Like, this is a horrible situation, and I shouldn't. And I was being very selfish. Mm. Of course, I should not have to put up with this person. I should not have to put up with what they're, what they're putting me through. I don't deserve this. But... And, and, and the more I fought, the more something in me still told me, you cannot leave. I wasn't serving God. I was not a Christian at the time. So what was it? Well, it was God. Did I know later on down the line I was going to get saved and, and, you know, essentially sold out to God? But see, God still was still convicting me. He was still trying to direct me in the right way because that's what God does. Whether people admit it or not, people feel guilt for the things that they do mo most of the time, I think. Even when I did drugs, do you know how often I felt down about the fact that I was a drug addict? Drug addicts are typically not happy being drug addicts. They're not happy with themselves. They're not Why? Is that because they know it's wrong? Well, yeah, they know it's wrong, but I fully believe it's the love of God and the conviction of God trying to draw them in. That's not what God wants for us. So I do think that, that the Holy Spirit convicts people that are not saved. How else does God try and direct us into his path? How else do we get saved? No. Which is why I said the thing about the Bible doesn't tell us everything we need to know. Right. I had never even really read. I, I don't even know if I had ever read the Bible before, before no. when all that happened. Um, what Serena's talking about is what Paul, <clears throat> what Paul talked about in Romans chapters 1 and 2. That the conscience is already bearing, is already showing them, you know, God, basically, paraphrasing here, but basically telling them about God without them knowing the law of God. Make sense? Great, great points, Serena. Really great points. This is the question of the week. What is the harm, what is the harm of bitterness? Really, really, really liked that discussion. Is this the question of the week? Um, yeah. Oh. I think you guys really had some good things to say. I really do. Those of you who uh, who are work who who you know did the did the assignment really good job, really good job.
And Gracie, Nicole, really liked your guys' answers. Serena, uh, Chuck, Dr uh, Diana, really, really, really liked it. Did you want to keep these? Look at. 